Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Um, probably the song that is sung most often by Christians and non-Christians alike. It's a song that and if someone's looking uh, in a moment of of joy at just the mercy and grace shown in the world, that's the song people erupt into. It's, it's funerals, it's the song people reach for, it's the song that, that people cling to. Uh, it has become a song that, that is known worldwide. Uh, and it, but it comes from a man named John Newton, written in 1772. This is, you know, this is an old song, uh, but it's a song that still just touches the heart. And then when you know the story of John Newton, the song really comes to life in new ways. Uh, the, the simple story of John Newton was he was a slave, uh, slave trader. He, he was the captain of a slave trade ship. He was in the practice of carrying human cargo for the point of selling them into slavery uh, from Africa. Uh, he talks about the, the thousands of souls that haunt him from those days. And, and, and he had a moment in his life, this is the simple story, that he had a moment in his life where he was uh, near death and he was waiting for uh, his ship to sink and the, there was some cargo on one of the ships he was on that filled the hole and he was crying out to God. And when the cargo filled the hole and saved the ship, he turned his life around. That's the simple story. Because often uh, what we want is a, an aha moment where our eyes are open. We were blind and now I see. And we want the simplicity where Jesus touches us in this moment. And our life is forever changed. But that's not typically how it happens. And, and it wasn't really how it happened for John Newton either, because he actually uh, grew up in a Christian nation. He grew up where everybody was Christians, and he grew up in a Christian household. He was very rebellious, and he actually had a lot of near-death experiences in his life. And in those near-death experiences, he, he would draw closer to Jesus, and then he would fall back into his old habits. Doesn't that sound more familiar uh, he, would, he would come close to Jesus for a while, and then he would fall back into old habits. And, and he even would go so far in his turning away from Jesus that he would mock others for their faith. And when people would come on his ships, he would actually uh, try to convince them to quit following God. So he wasn't just rebellious. He was actively against God at different points. And when he, when he actually turned towards Jesus, he continued to be a slave, uh, a slave trader. And he, he read scripture and he took what he was doing and he read scripture and justified what he did in his life. Do we ever do that? We go to scripture with our own convictions rather than scripture convicting us. And so he did that. And he read scripture in a way that said, it's okay for me to continue to sell people. And this is a, so what happens with John Newton is it's actually over decades of being haunted by the Holy Spirit. And I use that, that phrase haunted because it's the Holy Spirit, that, it's Jesus that continues to come into his life and to pull him closer to him. And it's through this ongoing transformation in John Newton's life that he later left the slave trade to become a minister. And as a minister, he joined the, abol the abolitionists and he helped end slavery in the world. He helped William Wilberforce topple the first domino that ended the slave trade. And, and this is a story of redemption that that needs to feel more like my story because the reality is uh, two weeks ago, I celebrated my 27th spiritual birthday. 27 years ago, I, was, I, I came into a committed relationship with Jesus where I said, okay, this is what's going to change in my life. This is what's going to guide my life. I didn't know what that meant at the age of 10, but I, I, I've continued to walk with Jesus. 
And in a continual walk with Jesus, I've had to confront the areas of my life where I'm blind so that I can find sight. That Jesus can open my eyes to the areas of my life where I need to be transformed. And it was never in a near-death experience. I, I've always wanted to have a big story. But the reality, the reality is the Holy Spirit haunts us all the same. And the question that our text this morning calls us to is, are we going to recognize Jesus for who he is, or are we going to stick to the traditions and the way we read scripture? Are we going to accept Jesus for who he is, or are we going to uh, seek after acceptance in culture and society the way that the blind man's parents do? And, and so we, we have this tension between us. And as I walk with Jesus, I find myself uh, confronted with my blind spots. That you know, there are times where I recognize I can get a little cantankerous. I can find, I find myself argumentative. My, uh, my lovely wife will let me know when those times are. But I've actually found not just in those moments, but sorry, Aaron, but in those moments, I, it's not just that moment that I'm being argumentative, but I find that I'm starting to live a life where I just want to argue about everything. And it's in those moments I have to step back and say, What's my blind spot here? What are some things that I need to develop in my life so that I can spend more time with Jesus? Because a walk with Jesus is supposed to be transformative. That when we draw close to Jesus and we say, I don't care about anything else but Jesus, the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we are transformed into his likeness. And so when I find myself being too argumentative, and I, I found this over the last year uh, during a pandemic, we've, all of our bad sides have come out, right? And, and so often we recognize the bad sides of other people that have come out, but not our own. We're really good at recognizing other people's blind spots. But there have been times over the last year that I found myself to be lacking in joy, to be lacking or to be lacking in peace. And, and I find myself more argumentative because I'm lacking joy and peace. And so one of the things I've been doing uh, this year over the last few months is trying to end every day with gratitude. And even on the worst days, stopping to give thanks that in my bad day, I, I still learn something from God that helps me help others. And when I take time to draw to end my day with a moment with Jesus, giving thanks for the things that he's done in my day, I find myself to be more at peace and more joyful. And I'm not saying that to say, okay, look at how great I am. I can go down a whole list of, of flaws I have. But what I'm doing to set this up is we, you have to be intentional. You have to be focused on Jesus. You have to decide what you're doing with your life to become more like Jesus. So often what we want to do is say, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. And I don't all my shortcomings, Jesus has got those. And what we end up doing is we find ourselves with the Pharisees saying, you were steeped in sin at birth, I'm a child of Moses. And what Jesus is saying is, I am God in the flesh. Look at the work that's being done. Do you not recognize God's presence with you? And you choose to step back and say, no, you're, you're not doing it the way that we think you should. The, the more you get to know Jesus, the more you realize what you're called to. And so we come into the Gospel of John, and we've, we've been in this, uh, this series of looking at the signs, and we've kind of been jumping around John, so I'm skipping over some great stuff. But, but I want to remind us, in John chapter 9, when we look at the, you know, the textual uh, stuff that John's doing, John, John is a beautiful writer. And I keep wanting to highlight how good of a writer he is, because he's not simply just recording the stories of Jesus. He is intentionally constructing the narrative in a way that invites you in. And this section in John starts in chapter 5, and it ends in chapter 10. 
But the two miracle stories uh, that frame this section, it's what's called, what biblical scholars call an inclusio. Uh, an inclusio is, is when you have bookends of similar stories. You, once you read those stories, you then say, whoa, there's something going on here. And then you actually go back and reread that section to see how these two stories shape your reading of the other stuff. So in chapter five, we, we read about the lame man, the man who's been le laying next to the pool at Bethesda, uh, Bethesda uh, for 38 years. For 38 years, he's been lame. I've only been lame for 37, but he's been lame for 38 years. And when Jesus says, do you want to get well, all he can offer are excuses. And when, he, when Jesus heals him, Jesus slips away into the crowd. And what does the man do? Because if, if I haven't been walking for 38 years and someone heals me, the first step I'm taking is in the direction of wherever he went. Am I right? That, that if you have been made well, you would think the first step you would take is towards the one who made you well. But, but John holds these two stories in this section in tension because what you have with the lame man is he goes into the temple and he gets in trouble. And when he gets in trouble, they say, who told you to carry your mat? And he's quick to say, I don't know who told me, which he doesn't recognize. He doesn't even know who healed him. But he's quick to give excuses. Well, it was the guy who healed me. He's the one that should be in trouble because he's afraid he's going to get kicked out of the place that he's been longing to go to. That as a lame man, he laid at the gates day in and day out. He laid at the pool. He, he could not actually go to the temple because of his infirmities. Because he was unclean. And so the first thing he wants to do is to take a step in the direction of where the presence of God is supposed to be. But when he steps towards the temple, he misses the presence of God who just healed him. And so at the end of that section in chapter 5, Jesus finds him in the temple. He says, stop sinning or something worse is going to happen to you. And it's in that moment he then goes to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and says, there's the one you're looking for. Not as a moment of praise, giving glory to the one who brought healing, but saying, don't kick me out of the temple. I just want to be in the presence of God and missing the presence of God in Jesus. And so at the beginning of this section, John, John tells the story of healing and the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the, the lawyers are, are coming in and saying, no, 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 hold up. This is the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. And they're angry about the process rather than what happened, giving glory to God for what happened. And so now we're in this story in John chapter 9. We'll just start reading in verse 1. And I want you to keep the story of the lame man in mind as we read this and think about how, he how the blind man responds differently. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? These are the kind of questions we ask. Um, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And we're going to do a study on the I am statements of Jesus. Uh, so I'm going to hold off on this one. We'll come back to it after Easter. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. And I want to pause just to point out, Jesus never heals, doesn't seem to heal anybody the same way twice. And I think the part of the reason is, is because it's not a magic trick. 
it's not something for you to search out and say, okay, if I do this, this, and this, then boom, I can heal the blind. What, what's going on here in the Gospel of Luke really highlights it's the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus that does these things. So we can get, sometimes get wrapped up on, on how Jesus does stuff, but the point is Jesus does it. So we keep reading in verse 8, it says, The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, this is, not, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it, it is he. And others said, no, it just looks like him. But he kept saying, I'm the man. And, and I love that he kept saying it. But these people are talking as though he's not there. I mean, we, we do this from time to time. We're talking about someone. They're going, hey, I can actually hear you. And in that moment, he kept going, no, let me clarify. It's me. Yes, Steve, you walked right past me every day for the last 10 years. Joe, you, you've thrown coins at me, didn't even look me in the eyes. That's why you don't recognize me. But it's me. I'm the blind guy that you and your family walk past on the way to temple every day. They knew this guy. And so he says, I, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes open? How is it that you came to sight? And he answered, and pay attention to this, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He says, I don't, I don't know. But, but he knew the name of Jesus, and he knew who to point to. He just didn't know where he had gone. And so the people, uh, you know, anytime a miracle or something like this happens, you got to go get the authorities. And so they brought the Pharisees. Uh, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been formerly been blind, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And, and he said to, him, said to them, he put mud in my eyes. I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, well, he's, he's got to be a prophet. But, which basically is saying he's, he's got to be from God, right? The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. Again, these are the things, anytime someone claims to have a work of the Spirit in their life, we're, we're quick to justify how it wasn't God. But the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then can he see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. And John lets us know the intention of the parents. If you don't pick up on it, here's, here's what their intention is. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put, uh, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. And it's fear. It is fear that the parents of their son who now has been restored, their son who had to beg yeah, I mean, think about it. The people who had come to the synagogue, the people who had walked the streets and who would see this blind man would say, oh, that's, that's their son. 
And, and the shame of a parent, the shame that a parent feels when their child is out of step with society, they, they felt that shame. And now they're back in that tension of, okay, their son's being rejected in a different way. We'll go ahead and toss him under the bus again. He's of age, ask him. Instead of recognizing that their son has been restored and giving glory to God, they're fearful of what society might say about them. And we feel that tension often when, when culture and society, the groups that we align ourselves with, when Jesus is calling us to transformation, we then start saying, well, if I, if, if I actually do what Jesus is calling me to do, that's going to make my life really hard. And we feel John Newton in this moment, feeling the tension of, I, Jesus says, love my neighbor, and I'm treating them as cargo. You know, but slaves are mentioned in the Bible, so I guess it's okay. And it was that continual work in John Newton's life that he said, you know, he finally said, enough is enough. Jesus is all. Jesus is the only thing I need. And if society wants to reject me, if my people want to reject me, if the church wants to reject me, all I have is the only thing I need, and that's Jesus. Because it was fellow Christians who were fighting against him in the abolition of slavery. And so fear, fear calls us to do lots of things that reject Jesus. Verse 24 says, so, the, so for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And at this point, this is like the third time he's had, having to have this conversation. He said, whether this man is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I used to be blind, I can see. And they said to him, well, then what did he do to you? Tell us the story. How did, how did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I, I've already told you. This is like the fifth time I have told this story. I used to be blind, now I see. He put mud in my eyes. But why don't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? I know. You want to be his disciples too, don't you? They reviled him saying, you are his disciple. We are the disciples of Moses. But as for this man, uh, we know that God spoke to Moses, but for this man, we don't know where he even comes from. And the formerly blind man answered, why, this is amazing. Oh, man, this is an amazing thing, isn't it? You don't know where he came from, but yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. And now this guy who couldn't go in the synagogue is in the synagogue teaching. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so when, when you don't have an argument anymore, what do you resort to? Insults. It says, you were born in utter sin. Let me bring up your past. You're terrible. You've never even been able to be part of society because of how you were born, and you're going to lecture us? You would teach us in our house, in the synagogue? You would come in here and teach us when you were born in sin. That's how you know they've lost the argument. 
and they cast him out. And they wrote all kinds of nasty things on Facebook about him. Because that's really how we do this, right? Anyways, I won't get sidetracked on that. But they kick him out of the synagogue. The thing that his parents feared from the Jews, he received himself. He's like, well, I just got in. Now I'm out. I'm back to where I started, but so much more. (laughs) Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, Who is he, sir, that I might believe in him? And we've been talking about this all through the series, that belief is shown in how you walk. That knowing the name of Jesus calls you to a certain way of walking. That when you believe in the name of Jesus, you will show the world in the steps you take. And what we see is the the lame man in John 5, as soon as he is healed, he doesn't turn to belief. He doesn't even know the name of Jesus. He walks in the opposite direction. And what we see in the blind man or the man who is formerly blind He says, just tell me who it is. I want to believe. Show me, point me in the direction of which I will walk. I mean, that's what it means to be a disciple, is to walk in the way of the person you follow. And Jesus said to him, you have seen him. The first person you saw, you have seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. And the natural reaction to knowing who Jesus is of coming into belief is to worship. And he says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. And what feels like a private conversation between Jesus and the man who was formerly blind turns out to be with a crowd of people standing nearby. Because it's the Pharisees at this point who are standing nearby heard the conversation and they said, well, hold up. (laughs) Are you saying that we're also blind? And Jesus just says to them, if you are blind, you would actually have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And and what he's saying to them is, you pretend that you can see because you've got the right reading of scriptures. You've got the traditions down. And the Pharisees, and and I want to pause to just say, the Pharisees are actually, they actually have the best of intentions. The Pharisees believed uh, this was a group that that formed, they had no actual power Um, political power in in early Judaism or in first century Judaism. They were an an influence group. Uh, They were Instagrammers, if you will. Um, Sorry, that's a really bad joke. But, But the Pharisees had influence in terms of like culture, Um, And what they believed, like at the core of Pharisaical belief is if, if we can get Israel, if we can get God's people to keep Torah for one day, keep Torah perfectly for one day, the Messiah will come. And so their intentions are good. If we can, if we can get people to be holy, set apart, like God for one day, maybe finally, after hundreds of years of expecting the Messiah, God will finally show up and bring glory back to his temple and be return his presence with us. So their their intentions are good. They they sought or they they read scripture, they they dissected the laws and they said, how do we give the most glory to God? Their intentions were good. How do we show God that we are serious about the faith? And they searched scriptures intently and they created laws and they created more laws and they created guidelines and they said, okay, well, scripture doesn't mention this, so we're not going to do it. And it mentions this, so let's do it to the, you know, the uttermost. And let's, let's, let's be as holy as we can. 
And then God will say, finally, my people have returned. Here's the Messiah. Okay, are you with me? This is the best of intentions. But in their desire to return the Messiah, they missed the Messiah when he returned. That they were so focused on the right readings of Scripture that they missed God's presence. And in the Gospel of John, John is building up to uh, the, the Holy Spirit being poured out on all people that Jesus says, it's better that I leave so that the Holy Spirit will be with you. And in our tradition, sometimes we've said, eh, the Holy Spirit ended, we have the Bible now, let's, let's follow this as closely as possible. And don't get me wrong, we follow Scripture as closely as possible, but we allow the Holy Spirit to move us because the Holy Spirit will never never contradict what Scripture says, but the Holy Spirit may contradict what we think it says or what we say about Scripture. And so are we drawing close to the Jesus we have in front of us or are we drawing close to the Jesus we've created in how we read Scripture? There's so much to say about this. But I, I want us to move, as, as I've been trying to practice in, in my preaching over the last uh, month or so, let's move from our head to our heart. John invites us into these stories to, to align with different characters and say, okay, what does it mean to be in relationship with Jesus from this character's perspective, that, that when we sit with the different characters in these stories, we then look at Jesus in a way that becomes a mirror to then look at ourselves and say, how do I become more like Christ? So I, I find myself with the Pharisees struggling to let go of my command over Scripture and allow Scripture to take its command over me. Where are the areas of my life that I'm controlling who God is rather than letting God tell me who he is through his presence? And when I look at the parents and I look at the lame man of John 5, and I feel this tension that, okay, Jesus has called me to do something, but it comes into, it comes into contrast with, with my culture. It comes into contrast with my country. It comes into contrast with my political party, my racial identity, my sexual identity, anything that I see uh, that, that draws, you know, that I find my acceptance in. It may come in, you know, following Jesus may come into contrast with my economic status and how I'm expected to live in, in this place. When I feel the tensions of the world saying, if you're, if you're going to follow Jesus like that, then you're not accepted here anymore. Which direction am I going, is my belief going to turn me? Am I going to take a step closer to Jesus, or am I going to take a step further into culture? Because the parents of the man who was born blind had to have been agonizing over their son who has had to live a life of begging. And instead of giving glory to God for the healing that he received, they stayed in line with their culture and they stepped away from Jesus. And like the, the real story of John Newton, a, a story of gradual and continual transformation, I sit with the blind man and I have to ask myself, what areas of my life do I think I can see where I'm actually blind? What areas of my life need some mud and some washing. Because when I leave it up to myself, I'm content with being a little, little bit aggravated and a little bit frustrated. But Jesus has called me to be a person of peace. And I can easily step back and say, you know, I'm, I'm aggravated and I'm frustrated, but man, I'm not nearly as bad as those people, so I'm okay. But Jesus has actually called me to be other than the world, not just a little bit better. 
And so what does it mean for me to draw near to Jesus, to allow mud to wash over the parts of my life that, that I'm not like him? And to then re-enter those spaces and say, let me tell you my story. How much, how much better would our churches be, would our church be, if we took time to tell our stories of transformation and celebrate how God has changed us? Because the more we tell our stories to one another, the more we respond with worship. That when I hear the stories of how you used to be a lot more angry and you used to be a fighter, you used to be someone who would throw down with anybody for looking at you wrong, but now you're a peacekeeper. You're a person who steps into tense situations and dissolves them. That is reason to give God glory and worship. What does it look like for us to share our stories together of transformation? So church, as we, as we come around the table, this is the place of transformation. This is the place where we pick up a very symbolic, but far from the reality, the body and blood of Christ. This is the place where we pick up our identity and we lay our false identity at the altar. Because when we gather around the table, we gather for transformation to become more and more like Christ. So Nathan, come, come and lead us as we prepare to break bread together.